Hallelujah. Amen. There's a song in my heart. Hallelujah. This morning that I want us to sing it. Used to appreciate the mothers in the house. Hallelujah. Sing it. 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 Hallelujah. Sing it.
I, I remember when we were growing up and my wife would be doing different runs, swimming, soccer, track, basketball. So she was like an Uber driver, but my wife got paid. Say amen, somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. She got paid by the almighty God, not by me. A mother is a counselor. She's full of wisdom. That's why the Bible says when they open their mouth, the Lord fills it with wisdom. I'm talking about the Proverbs 31 women, which we have in the house today. A mother is like a police officer. She keeps order in the house. And men, above all these things, the mother still have to take care of the husband's needs. Say amen, somebody. <laughs> so we really do appreciate all the mothers. We appreciate you for many reasons, for your selfless love, for your giving, for your undivided devotion as mothers. One thing we know is that mothers transmit hope and faith even when friends have given up, even when siblings have given up, even sometimes when fathers have given up, mothers never do. There's just something in their DNA. It's amazing how many people have testified how their mother's prayers changed them even when nobody else believed in them. Against all odds, a mother will get on her knees and continue to pray for her child that God will do a miraculous work. See, when I read 1 Corinthians 13, 7, it says, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And that's really the love of a, a mother. A former president, Abraham Lincoln, one of the greatest U.S. presidents, because he was the one that stopped slavery with the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, he said something very profound. He said, no one is poor who had a godly mother. No one is poor who had a godly mother. And why did President Lincoln say that? He said, I remember my mother's prayers. They followed me all my life. All that I am and hope to be, I hope I owe to my mother. And for many of us here, that statement resonates with us. Because we know that when people didn't believe in us, our mothers never gave up on us. Uh, so that's why we really appreciate all the mothers. And I have a warning to the Generation X. When you give a shout out to your mothers on social media, don't just say Happy Mother's Day. There was someone to say Happy Mother's Day. Love you, mom. By the way, send me $200. <laughs> today is not the day to ask say amen somebody the day is the day to give to your mothers and the Lord will honor you and all of us in Jesus name let's get to work so today I'm going to be teaching briefly uh, based on the theme that we have for this month of boundless living uh, I'm going to be teaching about be passionate be passionate about life be passionate about life. And uh, I have a very short anchor text this morning. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. Ecclesiastes 9, 10. It says, and it's not even the full scripture, it's just the A part of it. It says, whatever you do, do well. The New King James says, whatever your hands find to do, do it with your mind. Can you just look at your neighbor and say, you need to be passionate about life. And whatever you do, just do it well. Let us pray. Father, I, I thank you once again for the opportunity to preach your word. I put myself completely aside. Holy Spirit, I ask that as I open my mouth, you fill it with your words. Father, I pray that you give me the unction to teach that which you want your people to hear today. Father, I pray that as a result, oh God, that they will be energized, that mothers will be passionate about their roles, fathers will be passionate, even the younger ones, the children will be passionate about what you have in store for them. I prophesy over each and every one of us here that indeed we shall be able to live a God divine purpose in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask, oh God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And the church say, Amen. Amen. You know, it's easy to come to church and sing and dance and say, well, 
I know that was a good sermon. But today I, I deliberately have a short anchor text uh, because not only do I want you to remember the scripture, I also want you to have an action item. Say amen, somebody. Uh, you know, many of us, we, we come to church, we're excited, and that's good. You know, Sister Stacy led us in the praise and worship, and we were dancing. Bishop was doing his steps. I was trying to follow behind. And, you know, so we, 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 we're having a good time. But I noticed that, say, sometimes we come to church, we enjoy the service, and we don't have an action item, something, you know, that we want to do. Something that, you know, we'll say, well, I'm going to just do, uh, the, the, the word of God ministered to me about being passionate. So there's something I, I want to do about that. I want to improve myself. And can I just warn you, your action item should not be that, I wish my spouse was here to listen to the message. Oh, come on, help me now. <laughs> you know, sometimes we listen to messages and then we say, the action item on this is that I wish my my spouse was here. Sometimes in my house, my wife will say, Taiwo, she hollers my name. Yeah. She says, uh, come and listen to T.D. Jakes on this. Come and listen to, you know, Tony Evans or Steve Fortick on this subject. So I, 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 I roll my eyes. Or that Help me, somebody. Yeah, I need to pray. I said, girl, you know that everybody can gain something from that sermon. Is that she's telling me, you know, you need to learn something from what T.D. Jakes is teaching on this subject. That's an action item. I say, praise God, I'll listen to Bishop T.D. Jakes. I'll listen to Tony Evans. But don't let your action item be that, ah, Jimmy needs to hear this, this message. Say amen, somebody. The reason you need to have an action item is that uh, God has a divine purpose for each and every one of you. Because when I look at 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, I has not seen, ear not hear heard. It says, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So the dilemma is that God has prepared it for you, but you need an action item to enter into it. I pray you will enter into God's divine plan in the name of Jesus. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future. Which means no matter how bad things seem to be right now, the word of God over your life is that things shall get better in the name of Jesus. He says, I'm going to give you a hope. So just wait on me and you're going to enter into it. So those scriptures apply to us. That's why we need to have an action item. So when you come to church, you, you, you yourself, you begin to see I'm more tolerant now. I'm less easily irritated. I, I can listen more. I don't have to react to everything because then you are progressing. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4.15, it says, give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into the task so that everyone will see your progress. I don't want you to mark your life that you've been in church for 20 years and people don't see your progress. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. You know, there, there's a point you get to in life that even if nobody applauds you, you applaud yourself. You say, I know I'm saved. And because before, if you had spoken to me like that, I would have responded. So I might not have an applause, but I know that heaven records my progress. Heaven will record your progress in Jesus' name. So today, when we talk about being passionate about life, uh, we want to look at three areas to be passionate about. And there are much more than that, but we just look at these three areas because of our time. We look at how we can be passionate concerning ministry. When I talk about ministry, many people think about church, but your ministry starts in the home. Say amen, somebody. It starts in your role as a father, being a priest. It starts in your role as a mother, as we are talking about today. It starts in your role, and then, of course, there's the church and different ministries that are outside of the four walls of the church. We also look at, you know, the, being passionate about your personal role or your family role. Today, it's Mother's Day, so about being a mother or being a wife, like the Proverbs 31, wife and mother. Being a father and being a husband, being a brother and sister. And then finally, we look at being passionate about business roles. We are all, you know, progressive people, so we either have businesses or we have careers. How do you become passionate? Because if you lack passion in your business, it's unlikely you grow. So today, the Lord will grant you insight on how you can develop passion. Because mediocrity will not attract increase. Say amen, somebody. It is excellence that brings increase. So we look at those areas. But before we look at that, the, I want us to look at 
uh, two groups of people who should be in our lives, who, who are in our lives. And I, I use that as a foundation uh, to how we can then get on this platform to be passionate. So we have two groups of people in our life. Uh, the first group of people are the people that need you, either for emotional support, for financial support, you know, the people that you are comfortable around, people you have grown uh, you know, over your life with people that, and then there's another group of people, I call them the people that feed you, the people that are your mentors, people that challenge you. And, you know, when you do this uh, quick analysis, which I encourage you, maybe when you get home, just take a piece of paper and have a list. Who are the people that need me? Just put them down. And who are the people that feed me? What stream is feeding your life? You know, many of us will discover that the people that need us are much more than the people that feed us. And that's a problem. Because if all you are doing in life is giving out, guess what? You're going to run out very quickly. It's going to wear you out. So one of the things I want you to get in your thought process is that you should intentionally look at the second group, the people that feed you, the channels that feed you, and make sure that you are increasing that because it's a privilege to have people needing you. It's a blessing. But then you don't want to be giving out all the time that you yourself, you are not being refreshed. Say amen, somebody. You want to be in a place where as you are blessing, as you are ministering to others, you are also being refreshed. I'll give you a simple example. In ministry, if all you're doing is teaching and preaching and you're not being refreshed, it's going to wear you out. Because every time you minister, virtue goes out of you. So you have to replenish. You have to have conferences. You have if online. You have to have people that you listen to that will encourage you. You have to have groups. Otherwise, you know, it's the same old, same old. People come to you. They lean on you. And thank God that, you, you know, the, the, you have progressed in life. But you want to get the balance that as you are blessing others, you have people that are watering you. And then you say, Pastor, why do we need to balance that? Because when we talk about being passionate... If people are always taking from you and you're not refreshing yourself, it's easy for you to get into a place where you are worn out. Uh, you become discouraged, become despondent. But as you give out, either financially and God has blessed you that your investment is also giving returns, you are refreshed to greater height. And my prayer today is that no matter how lopsided it is, the Lord will give you wisdom to find streams of people that will feed you that will challenge you. And it's difficult because when God puts you in a different room, the initial reaction, you are, you're uncomfortable. You're comfortable because you're usually more comfortable with people that you have grown used to. So when people begin to challenge you or teach you new concepts, you know, sometimes it's not just about learning new concepts. It's about unlearning old things. The Lord will give you wisdom to unlearn and to grow your streams that feed you in the mighty name of Jesus. Also in business, you know that most companies, most progressive companies have either quarterly or annual training for the employees. Because no matter how well you're doing, one of the things they want to make sure is that we're also building you up so that you don't get drawn out. Of course, you're getting paid in employment, but the, the companies recognize that as you give, they also want to build your capacity. I pray the Almighty God will build your capacity in the name of Jesus. And one thing that's important uh, is that, you know, as you progress in life, ask for feedback. Some people take feedback as an insult. Hello? <laughs> Don't be all quiet. I mean, when your wife says you did something, say, did I really ask for your opinion? <laughs> Hello? Uh, feedback is not an insult. Uh, feedback just gives you the opportunity to say, well, I'm doing well in this area, but I can do better by doing this. Because uh, nobody's perfect. We're all a work in progress, is that not right? So if you want to improve, I want to achieve your goal, make sure that you get feedback from people that love you. Hello? In the, some people, they feel that criticism is a gift of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Don't go to those people, because they'll tell you everything that's wrong about you, and uh, that will wear you out. So get feedback from people that you know really care about you. That's one of the ways that you can improve in this process. Amen? So we want to look at 
at the next, it says, the enemy of passion is indifference. Let me, let me just say that again. The enemy of passion is what? Indifference. I, I've noticed whether it's in ministry, whether it's in business, whether it's personal relationships, you know, there's some people that are just indifferent about things. And being indifferent is actually very dangerous. It's not that you don't show up, but your attitude, sorry to say, just sucks. You go through the emotions, but your heart is not in it. And if, if you've been married for more than a minute, and sometimes you have an agreement with your spouse, and they're indifferent about it, over time you'll tell. Because you say, honey, I thought we agreed on this. You say, well, uh, well you, we said it, and uh, you know, we'll see God, God will do it. Which means she's indifferent to that decision. She, she's not being carried, or he's not being carried along. So indifference kills passion, really. It's the enemy of passion. Uh, people show up, but people, some people show up in church, but the attitude is that que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be in relationships. So you think in your mind, I thought we agreed on this last week when we discussed it, but then your indifference is pulling back things. So one of the things that I want to appeal with is that don't be indifferent to things. Don't be lukewarm to things. Uh, always have a position, and your position, you might not be able to agree, but at least once you are aligned together, follow that thought process and agree. Because the enemy of passion is indifference. So many destinies have been truncated by indifference. How, how do people, you know, go through divorce? Does indifference happen overnight? No, it doesn't. It happens over time. One spouse takes a decision, doesn't carry the other one along, and ultimately think, well, my voice is not being heard in this marriage. I'm not being valued in this marriage because you are the only one taking all the decisions. Or it could be a business partner. We think we should go this way. Strategically, we want to increase our product by 40%, and then you are not carrying along this, the important people. And ultimately, people are just going to leave you to do things. So one thing I want to challenge us is, don't be indifferent to things, whether it's in the home, in the marriage, whether it's in your business with your business partners, whether in your car, don't be indifferent to, 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 to anything because that can actually pull us back. And then I want to look at being passionate about ministry. Uh, you know, serving God is a drag for some people. You have to constantly encourage them. It's as if you are the one that called them, but nobody called you. It's God that called you. So, you know, when people, you give them assignments, and they're always looking for excuses not to do it. You find that in ministry. It's like a drag. You know, I didn't call you to ministry. You are the one that showed up and you said you want to work. So every time your HOD gives you an assignment, how come, you know, when people are passionate, they always have a way of overcoming obstacles. So they say, oh, pastor, it's not convenient, but I'm going to make sure that it, it works. But when something comes up, they will call you, pastor, I can't take this. So I look at TBS, for example, there, there's the schedule. There are some people that I know, come rain, sunshine, whatsoever, they're going to show up. But there are others that if it rains, they say, pastor, it rained on Monday. Sorry, I can't take TBS. Hey, listen, I didn't call you to ministry. I'm just giving you an assignment. So this your attitude sucks. I didn't call you. I'm just giving you an assignment. When your boss gives you an assignment at work, do you have the same attitude? You don't. So why do you want th think you want to come to the house of God and instead of seeing solutions to say things, all you see, you see problems. The Lord will help us in Jesus' mighty name. I want us to look at two scriptures, actually, uh, to show how it's important to God that we are passionate, somebody say passionate, about our responsibilities. We are passionate about our responsibilities. I was looking at this, uh, it's just a snippet of this scripture in Second Chronicles chapter 25, verse 2. And it says, Amaziah, a king, he did what was pleasing in the sight of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly which means he was not passionate about what he was doing. And I was asking, well, does it really matter? But to God, he does. It's not just what you do, it's the attitude with which you do it. God, that's why when 
The Bible was talking about the Laodicean church in Revelation 3.16. It says, if you are lukewarm, I will do what? I will spit you out. Which means you are doing the work, but your attitude sucks. You are not passionate about the things that are important to me. We look at this uh, scripture in Amaziah, and there's another one in 2 Kings between Elisha and another king that we look at. And to me, this passage is very instructive. It's very instructive how one can do something that is right, but God is still not very happy with it because you're not doing it with passion. And you say, Pastor, what do you mean? I, we give you an assignment. You do it, but you grumble about it. Hello? So you say, like, come on, sing in the choir. Pastor, why do I have to keep singing in the choir? Okay, somebody praise the Lord. You go through the motions. How do you think God is going to react to your service? You're doing it. You're showing up. But in your heart, you're not passionate about the things of God. You continue to grumble. You continue to complain. That's, that's all you do. And you'll always have to deal with issues in life. In fact, the more you can overcome issues, the more you're reward in the marketplace. They're looking for people that have solutions to problems, not people that see problems and all they can do is report the problems. <laughs> and the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Others will give you an excuse not to participate in things while the passionate one will say, hold up, there's a way around it. You know people that have others working for them, you know people that are passionate or people that, your colleagues at work, you know people that are passionate about the work, they always try to find a solution. Others will say, well, let's report these issues to management, and then management will resolve it. But do you know that the more you can fix an inefficiency, the more you can be versatile, the more value you add to the business, and ultimately that's how you'll be promoted. And the Lord will help us. So quit complaining about everything. Quit grumbling about everything. There will always be issues in life. Just especially when it comes to the things of God, because we are talking about ministry. If God has given you the capacity, just step out in faith, and the Lord will honor that in Jesus' name. When you are passionate about something, you operate above and beyond duty. We look at mothers. Many women that are mothers, they are passionate about their roles. Do you know most women are more passionate about their children than their husbands? Oh, come on, help me somebody. They, you don't have to encourage a woman about her children. But concerning her husband, I say, if, if not for God, help me, help me, if not for God, I don't even know whether I will still be in this relationship. But for their children, they pack them. That's why I said, can a nursing mother forget her children? The Bible did not say, can a nursing mother forget her husband? The answer would have been Yes. It would have been, Pastor, even if you know this kind of husband, you too, you, you will support me. The Bible they say, can a nursing mother forget her husband? Because most of them say, because, I don't even know how this man is in this house. But her children, no. They go beyond, and in fact, when the husband wants to discipline the children, he says, you are not the one that carried this one for nine months. Please, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him or to her. A mother always goes above and beyond duty when it comes to motherhood. But when it comes to the role of wives, they say, I'm just we are just managing ourselves in this relationship. You, you know it and I know it. But they never say that about their children because they are passionate about their children much more than their husband. The Lord will help the men in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. There will always be issues to deal with, whether you're in church or whether you're in the home or you're whether you're in the workplace. Uh, let me look at this second scripture, uh, Elisha and King Jehoash in 2 Kings 13, 14 to 19. And we don't have time to read everything. But this scripture opens up with uh, verse 14, it says, when Elisha was in his last illness, in another translation, it says, when Elisha was in a sickness that would lead to his death. So you know that whether you're in ministry or you're a medical profession, 
typically when they say that a, a sickness is terminal, that's very serious. So I looked at this scripture and I said, Elisha had a right at that time to say, no more ministration. Let me rest until I go to meet my ancestors. Let me rest. But he was passionate about ministry. I'm going somewhere with this. So the Bible says, when Elisha was in his last illness, King Jehoash of Israel visited him and wept over him. He said, my father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioters of Israel. He cried. Elisha told him, get a bow and some arrows. And the king did as he was told. Elisha told him, put your hand on the bow. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. Then he commanded, open that eastern window. And he opened it and he said, shoot. So he shot an arrow. Elisha proclaimed, this is the Lord's arrow, an arrow of victory over your enemies, Aram, that you will completely conquer them. Then, this is where it gets interesting. Watch this. In verse 18, then he said, pick up the other arrows and strike them against the ground. And the king picked them up and struck the ground three times. Somebody say three times. But the man of God was angry with him. You could have struck the ground five or six times, he exclaimed. Then you have, will have beaten Aram until it was entirely destroyed. Now you will be victorious only three times. So I had to go back to this scripture several times to see, did Elisha ever tell the king how many times to strike the ground? No. So it, it, it was a setup. And you know, God will set you up. It was a setup. Strike the ground with the arrows. It's up to you how many times. The number of times you strike the ground determines how much passion you have. Are you with me? It was a setup. When he was going to shoot the bow, he held his hands. But when it was time to strike the ground, he said, let me leave him to himself. Let me see how much you have in you concerning this. See, when they say there's a financial need in the church, do you know the attitude of some people? Oh, not again. Don't, don't come to me, pastor, because I have enough on my, on my plate. But the stewards will say, how can I help? Because God is not telling you how much to give. He just says there's a need. And then your attitude determines your action. So here, I, I was looking at this, and I, I really came to the realization that many times, God will Give us an option. How we react to that option determines how much we love him. How much passion we have for the things of the kingdom. Because the king could have said, prophet, you never told me how many times to strike the ground. Say, hold up. I told you. I gave you that option. It's up to you. Your passion determines your reaction. It determines your attitude to the things of the kingdom. Are you always looking at the minimum you can get away with? How much minimum can I give to the work of God? How much minimum time can I spend? How much minimum of, of my gift can I use? Oh God, here am I. Use me. Here am I. Send me. You know, that scripture is broken into two parts. The first is the obedience. And the king obeyed. The second is the passion. And because the king was not passionate about the things of God, he had victory, but he didn't have complete victory. I pray for every situation that you go through life, that when the Lord tests you, that you'll be victorious in Jesus' mighty name. Joash passed the first test of obedience, but he failed the second test of passion. In short, he settled for less than what God had planned for him. And that is the case of some believers because we're also always looking about our resources, our time, our restraints. Instead of being passionate, putting ourselves, God, you said I should do it. Caleb said at 85, give me this mountain and I will take it. Many of us at 60, they say, God, I just want to have a cool life. It's not time to retire. It's time to refire. Say amen, somebody. Amen. 
I don't know whether the king was tired. I don't know whether he was distracted. But the lesson here, which is very important for all of us, including me, is not enough to say I've obeyed the Lord. You must also obey the Lord passionately. You must obey him wholeheartedly. In other words, when God tells you to do something, be zealous about it. Be enthusiastic. Be passionate about it. Because that passion is very important to God. Remember what he told the church in Laodicea? He says, since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will speak to you out of my mouth. That will not be your portion in the mighty name of Jesus. The passionate people see themselves as stewards and they always ask, how can I help? Passion leads to a positive attitude while lukewarm people always make excuses not to do things. Quickly as I begin to close, you have to be passionate about your personal role. Today is Mother's Day. I explained that mothers are naturally passionate about their children more than they are usually about the spouse. Fathers are passionate about things that concern them as well. When you are passionate about your children, you, have, you become their main cheerleader. It's not that you don't tell them their faults quietly, but they know that somebody has their back. And that's very important for them. So that when they make mistakes, they know there's a safe place. They can come. They, they, you are not judgmental, but that you know that you, they, you love them. Passion is like fire. Unless you feed it, unless you stoke it, it will die. That's why the Bible says, stir up the gift of God in you. Fan to flame that gift of God in you. And that's why when I told you about the two groups of people, the people that need you and the people that feed you, the more you increase the people that challenge, feed you, cause you to grow, the more your passion will grow. The Lord will grant you the wisdom how to do that in Jesus' name. Be passionate about your role in business, about your job, about your career, about your business, about your investment. When you are passionate about your business role, it will reflect in the quality of your product or service. Others will not notice it and buy it. People don't buy iPhone because it's an American company. They buy it because they are passionate about their product. So when you look at their products, oh, okay, this is good. But how come you want people to still, you know, look at you and, 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 and buy things from you when you, are, you don't have a spirit of excellence? You don't, you don't do things with passion. They, they might manage it for a season, but they want to see the fire in you. They want to see you develop. Don't expect my loyalty when you yourself are not passionate about what you are trying to sell. Are you with me? When a man is passionate about sports, you know, if it's like you go and talk to Brother Olu about sports now, make sure you have time. <laughs> no, because he's not just going to tell you about basketball, he's going to tell you about all the coaches. He's going to tell you why this team is not going to make it to the finals. In fact, I made the mistake once in the gym that was... Uh, this African-American brother, you know, you, have, you want to be polite. So I said, hey, bro, how are you? It was much madness. I said, what do you think of college football? The guy put down his bag. <laughs> <laughs> he said, what do you want to know? I said, ah, I've, entered, I've entered this one today. <laughs> he was, for 20 minutes, he was lecturing me on America, uh, college football. So thank God I was on the treadmill. So he left. I said, praise God. But... Something in my mind said, this man is passionate. He's passionate about this thing. Are you passionate concerning the things around you? When business people are passionate about their business, they can't sleep. They can't sleep. They, they, they always think of how to improve. Yeah. Because they are, it's just in their DNA. They, want to, they just want to improve. They're looking at doing a deal or the next deal, they, once one deal is over, they are not happy. They want the next deal. And you have to be careful. That's why the Bible says the love of money. <laughs> so moderation. Somebody say moderation. Don't be so passionate about money that even your wife won't see you. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Even your children won't see you. They'll be calling on that people. Like my, my dad doesn't have time. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. Uh, it's not what you do that matters, but the way you do it that makes all the difference. Are you passionate about ministry? 
Are you passionate about your role? As a mother, we celebrate mothers today. Husbands, are you passionate about your marriage? Or everything is a drag? And my wife asked me, we're going to go on a date. I said, after 30 years, say, yes. We still have to go on it. God help me, somebody. <laughs> but that's, that's how you show passion. Because we are privileged. We have grown children. And so she said, yeah, you still have to date me. I said, okay. <laughs> so remember, Ecclesiastes is 19. Whatever you do, do it well. I have an action item, saints. Don't just come to church and say, well, service was good. Sermon was good. Do you have an action item? God loves progress. The Lord will give you insight. You will grow from strength to strength, from victory to victory. The Lord will increase your wisdom in the name of Jesus. But be passionate about your roles in life. Remember, passion is like fire. When you feed it and stock it, it will grow. Some people don't finish well, but I pray over you that you will finish well in the name of Jesus. Proverbs 22, 29 says, Do you see any truly competent workers? They will serve kings rather than working for ordinary people. Uh, in the old uh, version, it says, Seest thou a man diligent? Someone say diligent in his service, passionate about what he does. He said he will stand before kings and not before mean men. I prophesy that will be your testimony in the name of Jesus. The Almighty God will remove every ounce of mediocrity from your life, every ounce of passiveness, starting with the things important to God. You know, that you, you'll be excited when you're called to do the things of God because he has given you capacity. Uh, Moses thought he couldn't do it. God said, what do you have in your hand? God does not make mistake. If he has called you to do something, of course, you have to develop yourself. Don't step back. Ask God, give me the grace. Don't be like King Joash. In fact, from that scripture, I resolved. Anytime somebody strikes, asks me to strike anything, I'll strike it seven or eight times. <laughs> do you know why? <laughs> Man of God says ten. Seven is the number of completion. Eight is the number of new beginning. So don't strike three times. Don't have this attitude that just enough. No, your God is the God of more than enough. The fire in your life will come up. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Let me just, before I get, I want to pray for somebody in this house. Uh, as I was preparing, the Lord took me to 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 13. It's the story of Mephibosheth. He was a prince by title. And, but his circumstances were very challenging. And it was difficult for Mephibosheth at this point in his life to be passionate about anything. Because he heard the stories about his father. He had a royal lineage. He came from a royalty. And yet, here he was in Lodabar. The place of no destiny. It was a, like a desert. Somewhere, there was no hope in that town. And suddenly, somebody say suddenly. David could not rest. He said, is there still anybody left in the house of Saul that I may help? I pray for you. Your helper of destiny will locate you. No matter how challenging life seems to be for you today, there's a God that sits in the balconies of heaven. It will arise on your behalf in the name of Jesus. You know, Mephibosheth's story ended, the Bible said, he sat at the king's table. A crippled son, prince, taken from the backside of the desert. God is still in the business of doing miracles. Surely, it will attend to your needs. This Mother's Day shall mark a watershed in your life. A time of turning around in the name of Jesus. But I plead with you above all, be passionate about life. The Bible says, a living dog 
is better than a dead lion. You will not die before your time. You will fulfill your God-given purpose in the name of Jesus. Close your eyes and let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for this word. Thank you for Mother's Day. Thank you for the people that have come to celebrate even with your daughter. Father, I pray that as you've given this word to teach, oh God, it will germinate in their lives. They'll be able to multiply it, apply it, that their progress may be apparent to everyone. And we don't minimize challenges. We pray concerning those going through particularly difficult times, Lord, that you send help to them in the name of Jesus, that you will encourage them in their season in the name of Jesus. We speak concerning mountains in the lives of this one, that you level every mountain, and those that are in the valleys of life, that those valleys shall be exalted in the name of Jesus. I decree that their hope shall come alive. The Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire come, it's like a tree of life. I speak hope into every situation in this place, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I decree that the shout of joy shall be in every heart and in every home. Thank you, Father, especially today. We thank you for our mothers that are here today to rejoice with us. In Jesus' wonderful name, we have prayed. Amen.